So the title of the lecture, let's start there, Migration, Multiculturalism and Discontent. So I didn't actually write the title and I did have a bit of kickback with Amit and say actually this is not what I normally talk about, I don't normally talk about migration, I talk about immigration control, I don't normally talk about multiculturalism, I talk more about racism, but actually I think it's useful to keep this title and to kind of speak against the dominant framing. So that's how I'm going to uh, organise the lecture, talk about the dominant ways in which we think about, maybe not us in this room, but so that British society at large thinks about migration and multiculturalism and then to offer an alternative, an alternative language. And I'm going to suggest that thinking about the question of political membership is a useful way in and one that we don't always do or think about when we talk about racism. So let's start with the dominant narrative. The dominant narrative is that, so what's migration? Migration is when people move from one country to another for more than the short-term visit. So that's kind of roughly the UN definition and it's the definition that the UK have for measures of net migration. And in the UK context, by migration we normally mean immigration and we often associate that historically, as we've been hearing about, with post-war mass movement of people from the former colonies to the UK, starting with the Windrush. And the dominant narrative continues that when immigrants move to countries like the UK or other countries in Europe, they bring different cultures and different ways of life and that this can cause tensions between groups. And so therefore it's important that groups integrate and develop a shared sense of purpose and destiny and Britishness perhaps. So this question of integration is fundamentally related to the question of migration and multiculturalism. And there are different approaches to integration. So some states, uh, some governments have employed the policy of assimilation, which is where immigrants are expected to adopt the culture of their host country. So you'll hear this, you hear it in France consistently, but you'll hear it in, in the UK in the call for British values, for example, even though none of us know what they really are. Um, and then another slightly different approach is multiculturalism, which is where governments usually try and commit to recognising and respecting different cultures within an overall framework of tolerance, uh, democracy and liberty. Now, the reason I was hesitant to have a lecture title with multiculturalism in is because the literature, in my opinion, on multiculturalism is quite boring, uh, not very radical, very liberal, and not that useful in a lot of ways. So I don't want to go into what multiculturalism is as a kind of political philosophy, because it's long, basically. Um, but here we have the first two terms of my lecture. Migration, people moving from one country to another, from their country of origin to the UK. That's how we think about migration. And multiculturalism, is uh, in connection with integration, is about the kind of policy approach for dealing with difference when migrants move. So less accurately, and this is the beginning of the different framing, actually what multiculturalism and integration are about, most kind of concisely, is what do we do with them? That's probably the, uh, the way in which I would cover most of this literature and most of the politics of integration and multiculturalism. So what about the third term of the lecture, which is discontents? Firstly, if we stay with the mainstream, we don't have to look very far to locate these mainstream discontents with migration and multiculturalism. So here have some tabloid headlines, infamously Katie Hopkins, and this is an image from the Daily Mail or the Daily Express in some story about Calais. So whether about waves of migration or floods of migration or the refugee crisis or Muslims who have failed to integrate or children caught between cultures um, or more broadly fears around crime youth and the city. Discontents around migration and multiculturalism are everywhere and they shape our political landscape. But these are not my discontents. My discontents are not about migrants and multiculturalism but about racism and that's what this lecture is about. So we can rethink the title if we want but th this is the lecture I'm going to give anyway. The lecture is about thinking through these discontents and offering an alternative vocabulary to the mainstream that we just described. And so that's what I'm going to do for the lecture but here's Four questions that guide us in this lecture, and I want you to, I'll keep coming back to them, but I want us to think about them throughout. So the first question, who is a member of the nation? The second question, how does this change over time? What does this have to do with racism? And what kinds of practices are justified against non-members? So I want those questions to be in our mind as we go through some history, uh, and I will keep referring to them as kind of coordinates in the question around migration, multiculturalism and discontent. So firstly, the first question when we're trying to think critically about the mainstream narrative on migration is who counts as a migrant? So I started with the beginning by saying a migrant is someone who moves across the border for a longer term, longer than a short term visit. But not everyone who moves across the border for a long, long to medium term is called a migrant. We have expats. There are 
travellers, backpackers, diplomats, students, soldiers. Uh, so in the UK as well, not only, so expats we associate with British people, usually white people moving abroad, and migrants are people moving here. But also within the UK, not all non-citizens who live here, so people who are not British citizens by law, are considered migrants either. So the elite businessman, the French nanny, the Australian backpacker, are rarely what we mean, or what the tabloid press mean when they talk about immigrants. In fact, some of those Australian backpackers might be overstayers. They might be working more than they should be, or they might be overstaying on a visitor visa. But they're rarely what we mean when we talk about the illegal immigrant. On the other hand, some British citizens get referred to as second or third generation migrants. So even if we're born here, and our parents are born here, the label of migrant is still hard to shed. And this is stuff we know, but what it means is that the label of the migrant, the category of the migrant, has everything to do with race. And so if the migrant as a label is not a legal term really, but a discursive, a, a label in discourse which is loaded with racial implications, then the same is true of multiculturalism. It's racism which defines which kinds of difference matter and are visible, and which become a problem for states as they try and manage diversity or organise cultural difference. But before we, so this is the kind of beginning of a framework which helps us challenge the mainstream way of talking about migration and multiculturalism and to think differently about it. And I'm sure we all are already developing these kinds of ways of criticising the mainstream. But before we even go into criticising the anti-immigrant politics of the UK and Brexit and all these other things that we've been talking about a lot recently, I want us to start by unsettling the taken for grantedness, the naturalness of nation states and of countries. Before we come right into the UK and think about the tabloid press, let's just zoom out even more and think about the borders we have and the countries we have as we know them. So how did we end up with these nation states? Firstly, a lot of work, this is what these images are supposed to show, um, a lot of work goes into naturalising the world order and the countries we have. So we have flags, national anthems, the World Cup, which we all enjoyed probably, the Olympics, the UN. But behind all these various acts of kind of theatre where nationalism gets, becomes part of our common sense, they're all backed up by the legal force of citizenship. So what's citizenship? There's a lot of talk about citizenship in the scholarship and it tends to be about how people relate to politics and how they identify with their nation. But I want to think about citizenship in global terms and in relation to global inequality. So citizenship is the universal political condition. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that everyone should be a citizen of somewhere and citizenship globally assigns individuals to states. So the logic is, in a world of 7 billion people, everyone should have a state, and each state is responsible for its citizens, which is why migration then is a kind of, apparently an aberration from the norm, because individuals leave their state and go to another. So immigration law is this whole complicated system about how to filter, organise, restrict the movements and rights of people who move from their state to another. And importantly, the logic, the logic of this is that every state has the sovereign right to control its borders. Everyone has the right to determine who can come in and who can stay. So that, that the idea then is that justifies, uh, immigration control is justified because citizenship is a fair and equal rational way of organising individuals and populations to states. But this dominant narrative on citizenship and on, on states imagines that states are equal within the, within the international system. But we know that states are not equal within the international system. So this is just a, a map I found online of migration routes, so red, I uh, can't see it that well in this light, but you can see a bit, red is where people are, net emigration where people are leaving, blue is where they're coming in. So this big red one is, is Syria actually at this point in 2017. But the point of drawing attention to that map is it's one way of thinking about global inequality. It points to some of the ways in which people move along specific routes, so all states in the system are not equal. People often retrace colonial routes in reverse. We've heard about that. This is the history of this country. It's the history of the constitution of this room. People often retrace uh, colonial routes in reverse. But more broadly, people often move, migrate in search of security, better life chances, better futures, and often firstly within their own countries to cities. That is what is happening to the world. And then within their regions. But some people move to the overdeveloped world from the underdeveloped world. So there are really compelling reasons why people might move from the underdeveloped world to the overdeveloped world. This is not a system of equal nation states where everyone has a citizenship and there's reasons for everyone to move everywhere. There are really compelling reasons for people to move in certain places. So here's a map of global inequality. 
red being, uh, it's, it's actually, sorry, it's a map of income, of the world by income. So here, blue, the darker the blue, the lower the income, the more red, the higher the income. And if we think about the racial connotations of that map, think about what those countries are, US and Canada, settler colonies, the whole of Europe is deep red. There's a, a strange anomaly with the Gulf and oil, and there is with Singapore as well. Then Australia, another settler colony. And then the blue, that depressing sight of all that blue. And this is also a map of wealth. So this is a map of the world. And then when you, so this is a kind of human geographical map where you inflate the size based on wealth, personal wealth. So this is what happens when you make the space in the map uh, uh, related to personal wealth. So you can see Africa becomes almost nothing. And this kind of bloated, sort of, I think it's sort of a powerful map, this sort of bloated whiteness, which is probably a better way of thinking about white privilege than the way we often think about it. This is the privilege, this kind of taking up of the world's resources. And you can do the same with energy consumption, you can do the same with all sorts of things. <clears throat> so let's think about that when we think about migration, citizenship, who can move where, and states' rights to control the mobility of people. How did we end up with the borders we have, and are they fair? And of course, the people who often have the most compelling reasons to leave are the ones who are the most restricted. So we know that from the crisis in the Mediterranean, for example, that people will pay more for a, uh, a journey on a rickety boat than you might on a, for a kind of first-class flight to Australia. And this map, it doesn't show it very well, actually. In fact, can anyone even see that? You can on the TV screen, OK. So if you can see the TV screen, look to the TV screen. But this is a... Well, it's, it's a website that says how powerful your passport is, but a better way to think of it is how much your mobility is restricted. So the darker the colour, the less countries you can travel to, visa-free, and, and, and the more restrictions there are when you move in. So again, we see this similar, maps onto the similar uh, map as the rest, but those with the most compelling reasons to do, those turn into illegal immigrants, uh, and those immobilised in places of global scarcity are the ones who might have the most compelling reasons to move. So... And, of course, none of these inequalities, these disparities, wealth, health, energy use, and mobility, are incidental. The countries we have, the incredibly unequal countries we have, were all formed through colonial histories. So this is an, an, another way to think about citizenship, which is fundamental to the logic of immigration control and the, the idea that it's, we take it for granted. Citizenship, then, on this account, uh, the idea that we're all equal because we all have a state and each state is responsible for each person who's a citizen there, is a system of colonial forgetting. That's one way I want to think of it. Citizenship is a system of colonial forgetting. And borders trade on colonial amnesia. So, or less sympathetically, borders are racist. So let me ask again, how did we end up with these nation states and these borders, and are they fair? So let's think about that, the relationship between colonialism, colonial history, the borders we have, movement and who can move, uh, and go back to those fundamental questions that I started with, who is a member, how does it change over time, what does this have to do with racism, and importantly, what can be justified against those who are deemed non-members. And we'll travel through a bit of the history of immigration legislation in the UK briefly, I don't want to go over it too much, and then talk a bit about today. So let's give a history of British immigration and nationality law, they both work together. The first piece of substantive immigration legislation in the UK is the 1905 Aliens Act. And it was a response directly to the arrival of Jews from Eastern Europe who were escaping religious persecution. In a 1905 editorial in the Manchester Evening Chronicle, a journalist wrote, The dirty, destitute, diseased, verminous and criminal foreigner who dumps himself on our soil and rates simultaneously shall be forbidden to land. This was in the justification for this, these controls. And for me, that's remarkably familiar. It actually sounds quite like Katie Hopkins. <coughs> So that's important. Anti-Semitism was central to the introduction of the first, the UK's first immigration legislation, and it is the same in the US 20 years earlier, the Chinese Exclusions Act, and in Australia, a white Australia policy at the turn of the 20th century. So when the Windrush migrants, who we've heard a bit more about recently, arrived from 1948 onwards, there was already a history of racist concern about immigration, and already, of course, many deeply um, embedded colonial hierarchies uh, from Britain's empire. Of course, it's not that Britain did not need people to fill labour shortages. They very much did. It was that colonial racial hierarchies organised who was, who was seen as desirable. And so migrants who came from the Indian subcontinent, from Africa and from the Caribbean, 
were also, like the Jews 50 years earlier, deemed undesirable, associated with crime and disease, and defined as putting pressure on services like housing, healthcare, and employment. And so these, these racist concerns about immigrants, the kinds of coloured immigrants, that, that's how they defined the problem of immigration, were central to the changes that Britain made to its immigration and nationality laws. So I want to talk about that and think about it in relation to the question of membership, how it changes, what it has to do with racism, and uh, what can be justified against those who are turned into non-members. Non so I don't want to go over this in too much detail. Uh, it's actually been alluded to in both the talks, this brief history of immigration legislation. It's kind of a, it's a, it's, it's a thing we should all know and it's a thing we have to understand. But so we start before 1948. Britain has always been an imperial country. Always been an imperial country. But when England and Scotland um, joined in union, they were both had imperial, uh, em had empires. And so before 1948, there was no official definition of British citizenship. It was just assumed that it was subjecthood and that people could move at least to the UK, even though countries like Canada and Australia were introducing racist immigration controls on people from other parts of, of the empire. And so in 1948, Britain introduced citizenship controls for the, sorry, citizenship for the first time. Crucially, they created the category of citizen of the UK and colonies. So there was no distinction between a citizen of the UK or a citizen of Ghana in law which included everyone born or naturalised in the UK and its colonies, and all had a right to move to the UK, work, settle and claim benefits. Also, people from former colonies from the Commonwealth, in fact, the ones who were seen as much more desirable to the British elite, were also free to move, those from countries which had gained independence, India, but also Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Sorry, to, to make, make that clear, the, the people who were desired were the white migrants from the old Commonwealth, not Indians, but they, but they were all allowed to move. So at this point, in 1948, 850 million people had the right to move to the UK, and the UK had a huge demand for labour. Right, so we, most of us know this story a little bit. But from the very beginning, some subjects were more welcome than others. Black and brown newcomers were immediately a cause for concern, even though relatively small in number. So in the years between 48 and 62, there were still more people arriving from the old Commonwealth, white migrants from Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and from within Europe, and of course Ireland as well. But the problem of immigration was always the problem of coloured immigrants. That was how it was defined, whether implicitly or explicitly, often both. But crucially, the problem for the British government, who didn't want, who was hostile towards these newcomers from the Indian subcontinent and the Caribbean, was that they were British subjects. So they weren't immigrants, they were citizens or subjects moving within the British realm. So what, does the, what should the British government do? What, what was its options? These people who were undesirable were moving to the UK, as was their right, but they were unwanted. And here the answer is simple, and it comes back to the question of membership, which I started with. Change the definition of membership. Change who counts as British. Um, and also create hierarchies of Britishness and attach immigration controls to some, uh, some categories of Britishness and not others. And that's precisely what they did. So the 62 Act meant that colonial and Commonwealth subjects had to apply for vouchers and the UK could change how many vouchers it gave out. Unless, of course, they had a passport issued by the UK or a parent who was British from the British Isles. At 68 then, barred the entry of people who were citizens of the UK and colonies to those who were born in the UK or had at least one parent born in the UK. So it was an attempt to stop this primary migration. And then the 71 Act... Introduced the, contract, in, introduced the concept of patriality. I don't know if people have heard of this concept. But patriality defined rights to settle in the UK in terms of ancestry in Britain itself. So having a parent or a grandparent born here. And of course the effects of that were that Australians, people from New Zealand and Canadians, white, um, white Canadians, Australians and New Zealanders, find it quite easy to access and to move to the UK, whereas the law of patriality in terms of descent excluded people from the Caribbean and South Asia. And that's still the case. I meet quite a lot of white Australians or New Zealanders who have ancestral visas. I mean, you can't get an ancestral visa very easily if you're not white. And then, finally, the British Nationality Act, which came in in 81, formally ended the distinction between former colonials and aliens from other countries and defined citizenship in national terms, tried to make a definition of British citizenship with only those who had the right to be here were those who were uh, born in Britain or parents were born in Britain. And it also got rid of birthright citizenship. So since 1983, when the Act came in, if you're born in the UK but your parents aren't British or 
settled, so have indefinite leave to remain, then you're not automatically British. So there are tens of thousands of people living in the UK who are born illegal, and that's a product of the 1983 laws. So this is the UK's response, apparently not about race, but clearly incredibly raceful changes, making citizenship related to ancestry, descent, this small island, and also by uh, blood rather than by the law of the soil. And so this is undeniably uh, racial in intent and with racial consequences for the British nation and about the exclusion of those who were moving from the former colonies and who were deemed undesirable. And it did make a big difference. So net migration from 1971 roughly to the early 1990s reduced to very close to zero. People were still moving, but that movement of people was pretty much cut, primary migration in lots of ways. A lot of people moved through family, but especially from the Caribbean, that migration really cut to closer to zero in terms of net migration of people moving in and out. And so we talk a lot about Britain as multiracial or multicultural. And the docking of the Windrush is seen to hail the irresistible rise, this is a book by Trevor Phillips and Mike Phillips, the irresistible rise of multiracial Britain. But it could be a lot more multiracial. And that's what I want us to think about. The ways in which borders define the nation in racial terms by its exclusions. There are thousands of families who were split across borders who wanted to reunite in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and today, but who could not because of shifts in UK immigration and nationality law. There are still many families who are split by the border. Some find ways to move anyway. They join family members, they study, work um, or marry, but increasingly they're rendered illegal. And that's what the hostile environment, which we've been talking about a lot more recently in the news, uh, that's really what it helps us think about, the ways in which people are rendered illegal when they live here. So perhaps if we're thinking about this history of turning colonial subjects into immigrants and into illegal immigrants in particular, the most stark image of this shift for me is the fact that there are currently hundreds of former colonials detained in UK immigration centres. So Indians and Pakistanis are some of the highest numbers of detainees in immigration removal centres, but also Jamaicans, Nigerians, Kenyans, Ghanaians, Bangladeshis who are detained right now, currently, near our airports, in Heathrow and Gatwick especially, in immigration prisons run by private companies like G4S, Serco, or Mighty. <laughs> and every few weeks, a mass deportation charter flight leaves for Jamaica, Nigeria, Ghana, or Pakistan. These are former colonials being deported by cover of darkness, restrained in body belts, exiled from their families in the places they may have lived for many years. This is how far we've come from 1948. And again, I want to return to that question. Who is a member? How does it change? What does it have to do with racism? And what can be justified, importantly, against those defined as non-members? So since the 91 Act, since the 81 Act, a lot has happened in terms of immigration law. A lot, I mean, New Labour were the most prolific in introducing immigration legislation, particularly around asylum. But just to breeze through it, I suppose New Labour's policy was very much targeted against it. it at targeting asylum seekers who they determined to be bogus asylum seekers but also about trying to manage migration in a particular way to get cheap flexible labour on temporary uh, immigration statuses and also to attract what they called the brightest and best and then Gordon Brown backtracked somewhat and said British jobs for British workers but there was an attempt to do all of these things at once to get flexible easy labour in to get bright elites in uh, and also to build detention centres and exclude asylum seekers in particular and then post-2004, we saw a lot more discourse on the dangers of migration within Europe, um, particularly from Eastern Europe after the accession of 2004. Uh, and these, these kind of racial politics around immigration has, of course, been related to the war on terror, to broader forms of securitization, war in the Middle East, the Arab Spring, and the refugee crisis being some kind of moments where, some uh, significant moments. <clears throat> and of course, more recently, Brexit, the hostile environment, and the Windrush scandal, which have been the last couple of years, have been the way in which the question of race, the British nation and immigration have kind of been played out. So Brexit. I'm not going to talk about Brexit for too long. And Kojo is doing it tomorrow. Uh, he's talking about colonial amnesia and Brexit. And I think that'll be really engaging for those who are around. But we can view Brexit, think about Brexit, in terms of this longer history, in terms of Britain coming to terms with its loss of empire and trying to define itself as a small island white nation. Which, so there's a lot to learn from thinking back to the history of post-war legislation uh, and the question of membership. So let's compare a bit with the post-war migration and the changes to legislation. 
what we had then was a set of moral panics about immigration and about coloured immigration in particular, right? Followed by radical changes to nationality law, changing how Britain related to its, to its empire, its commonwealth. And then we saw a lot of resources committed to excluding immigrants and to policing immigration. With Brexit too, you had many years of demonising migration from Eastern Europe, especially of Romanians, Poles and the Roma. And then a radical change to the way Britain related to this larger political body, the EU. Not dissimilar to radical changes to the way it related to the Commonwealth. And the desire to retreat, to take the country back and to remove the rights of people to move here, which are in effect are citizenship rights, the rights of European citizens who can currently move and settle in the UK. In both cases, and this is the point I want to make, the legal definition of membership, who counts as a member in law, was intimately connected to and feeding off and responsive to the cultural politics of nationalism and in particular the, the, the kind of racism of the beleaguered white native. <coughs> so that's an important point. Racism in wider society is always in dialogue with the legal borders of Britishness. Racism in wider society is always in dialogue with the legal borders of Britishness. So actually looking at the border, <coughs> how it's changing, how we're changing our definition of membership and what we're doing to those defined as non-members is a good way in to thinking about British racism. And then of course we have the hostile environment. So there's been a lot of talk about the hostile environment in, in light of the Windrush scandal. But the hostile environment, not everyone always knows what it is, so I'll give a brief description. So the hostile environment broadly refers to, refers to a set of policies introduced in 2014 and 2016 Immigration Acts, which are about bringing everyday borders uh, into the centre of public life. So that means landlords, NHS staff, lecturers, teachers, employers, social workers, the driving licence authority, banks, have to perform bordering checks and ask everyone for their right for their, uh, their proof that they, can they have a right to access services. So we have new rights, like a right to rent, which didn't exist before. So Theresa May, May introduced these policies when she was Home Secretary. And the idea was that by excluding illegal immigrants from <coughs> basic services, housing, employment, healthcare, their lives would become so unlivable that they would leave. That that would be the most effective way to send people back. And her own language, the reason it's called the hostile environment, now called the compliant environment, which makes no sense, <coughs> is because in her speech she said, these policies are intended to create a really hostile environment for illegal immigrants. So that's, that's the language she used. And importantly, <coughs> it feels like the terms of the debate have changed a little bit since the Windrush scandal, but it wasn't very hard for her to pass these policies. They weren't as controversial as you'd think then. Of course, migrant rights activists and, and anti-racists were... We're talking about them because they followed on from a long line of awful policies. But they weren't that hard or controversial for them to pass. So the hostile environment is a particularly brutal form of border control, which is everywhere, it's very insidious. But it's just an extension in many ways of existing powers and a consolidation rather than anything new. <coughs> really, it's an attempt to increase the effectiveness of, sending, of being able to locate those who have no, no right to live in the UK and of enforcing their removal. But the question of the legitimacy of doing that, of rendering people illegal and then excluding them, detaining them and deporting them, has been set and has been a consensus for a long, long time before. <coughs> so that's, that's really the argument I want you to take home, uh, is that this question of membership is central to how racism gets articulated. The question of who counts as a member is central to how racism gets articulated. Or more directly, immigration controls fuel racism, and so anti-racism means resisting immigration control. Now, some of you there might be thinking, we need to have restrictions somewhere. Perhaps things would be even worse, racism-wise, if more people were arriving more quickly. And that's the actual logic of the mainstream. That's the logic of both parties, and has been for decades. The idea is that some control on numbers is necessary to ease racial tension. <coughs> but the, so yeah, so the logic is, for the sake of good integration, we need to limit numbers of those moving in. To combat discrimination, we need to ease the flow of newcomers. But I want to claim that the opposite is true. Limits on immigration do not foster good race, race relations, they justify racism. Immigration controls legitimate and fuel racism. They confirm that Britain is a white nation and that the nation is united by invisible ties of blood and soil. And they rely on colonial amnesia as well, of course. So let's think about some connections. If I'm saying that immigration controls foster racism, let's, let's draw some connections. And I want to focus on um, 
a couple of things we know to be racism and then try and relate them to the border and the question of membership. So, I want to ask one of the young people if they know what KBW stands for. Anyone who's under the age of 20 is allowed to answer. Can someone help them who's older than the age of 20? Yeah. So this is the slogan, and actually there was a piece of graffiti in Rochdale which said very similar recently. It was in the news, I don't know if people saw that. So maybe we haven't come that far, or maybe, maybe the opposite. But, you, but so, this was a slogan of the National Front. And we've heard a little bit about the National Front. The far-right group who terrorised blacks and Asians for many decades. The far-right group that people like my dad had to run away from. And this was their slogan, keep Britain white. And it's, it's also associated with powerlessism, with repatriation, and it's a profoundly racist sentiment. We all recognise that that is a profoundly racist sentiment. And yet my point is that through that history of immigration law and nationality law, what were those laws doing in practice? They were keeping Britain white. That's what they were intended for, and that's what they did to a large extent. So they might have been doing so in shrouded terms and a word like patriality, which no one really knows what it means. But it was about defining Britishness in terms of descent, ancestry, and race, and about excluding all those who had a relationship to Britain who weren't white. So it granted white Britons what rights, and it stripped them from brown and black British subjects. So nationality law and immigration controls keep Britain white. These bureaucratic, seemingly important, necessary, natural things, immigration controls, can't be disconnected from the slogans of the far right and the terrorism of the far right. And what about that popular refrain, go back to your country? Anyone put their hands up if, anyone, if anyone's ever told you to go back to your country? That's a lot of people. Yeah, that's more than half the room. Wow. Um, yeah. <coughs> This racist refrain, which we all recognise as a kind of central statement of British racism, it became so popular because it was the active demand of the right. Repatriation, and here Powell is crucial. And I think the call for repatriation was, and still is probably, incredibly popular. But that politics of repatriation, that claim that people should go back to where they come from, is bolstered, encouraged, uh, kind of legitimated by the realities of deportation regime. When the Home Office deports our friends and family members, are they not enforcing the demands of the street racist? Go back to your country. Mm. And what about the question, but where are you really from? Uh, let's do another hands up. How many people have had the question, but where are you really from? <laughs> That's even more. Um, yeah. <laughs> and obviously, normally our response is indignation, and I'm from here, or maybe not, whatever. You know, this is a frustrating thing to hear. But this is what immigration checks really ask us all to do. They're, they're, they're what the everyday boarders are asking NHS workers, lecturers and teachers to do. Where's your passport? Where are you really from? And we know that immigration controls are enforced against black and brown British citizens. We know that they're the ones who are going to be asked. Because how, how do you tell the difference between a black British citizen and an immigrant? I mean, how do you do it without asking for a passport? So these questions affect all of us. Immigration raids target ethnic minority businesses. Um, stop checks at tube stations target in Brixton station, you know, you, you can see how they target all of us. So where are you really from, that question, again, is really related to and filled with significance by the immigration regime. See here, I'm trying to draw connections between immigration restriction, which often is defined as natural, bureaucratic, necessary. We all know who the members are, it's just about uh, controlling borders and the cultural force of British racism, connecting these two things, the seemingly bureaucratic uh, and unquestioned a lot of the time, and the kinds of racism that we all recognise and that we all speak about when asked, what are your experiences of racism? Probably go back to your country and um, where are you really from would be t high on the list. So I want you to think about that in terms of this alternative to the dominant narrative. Next time you hear or read I mean, avoid it at all costs if you, if you can, because it's tiring, but the, the discourse of the far right, of Tommy Robinson, of Britain First, of the Football Lads Alliance, actually think about what they're saying and arguing for, and then go back and listen to Theresa May or David Cameron or Tony Blair give a talk on immigration or integration. They have a lot in common. They have this shared problem space. Um, and they might have different strategies, different methods and constituencies, and those, are, those differences can be important. But they share a definition of the problem
And so it seems unacceptable to say keep Britain wa white, and yet it is what borders do. It seems vulgar to tell someone to go back to their country, and yet we know that the Home Office works to deportation targets. So that's my central point. To understand racism, we need to focus on immigration restriction and nationality law and on the question of membership. Questions about membership, about who counts, about what should be done with non-members, are central to how racism gets articulated in specific moments. And we saw that with Brexit. So that's all a bit depressing. And I wanted to... <laughs> but, it, but I think it's important to have some tools, some simple tools, for thinking about the mainstream, challenging it, uh, when it comes to questions about migration and multiculturalism, which can be exhausting. And I think that question of membership and history is useful. But what about resistance? So these two pictures have actually both been used before by Sita and John. There have been many, so there have been many kinds of resistance historically to UK immigration restrictions, and we heard about them from both John and Sita. There have been anti-deportation campaigns, activists, NGO and legal organisations working together and being set up, legal centres set up, and then community organising legal work, direct action, often in connection then with other kinds of anti-racist struggles around street racism, police violence, education struggles, struggles in the workplace. But central to some of these older campaigns, from my reading of it, are some, are some claims. So some of the claims around the, the histories that John was tracing for us, one of the claims of these older um, forms of resistance is that immigration controls are racist in design, intent and consequence. <clears throat> the immigration controls perpetuate colonial hierarchies and inequalities. And this is what both Sita and John were talking about. The politics where what's happening here, the racism we're facing on our streets, is intimately connected to the struggle of people in the third world. And that's the, that's the last point. Struggles here, our struggles here, struggles on immigration legislation, are connected to the struggles of people in the, what was then called the third, third world. And I think we can learn a lot from these principles for thinking about immigration control in a more radical and useful way, in ways which can foster resistance which looks... Uh, which looks to the, to the third world. And so, the quote you may have heard, but one of the rallying calls of a kind of anti-racist, anti-imperialist politics was, we are here because you were there. People heard that? Yeah. Yeah. And it was a response both then to the calls for repatriation from the far right, from Powell, um, we are here because you were there, but also a response to this consensus on, in Labour and the Tory party that good race relations relied on controls on immigration. The response, we are here because you were there, kind of said no to that. So we need to find ways to transpose this powerful call to our present. So this means both repeating, we are here because you were there. So in light of the Windrush scandal, you hear a lot of people saying, we were invited. But that's over-exaggerated. Most people moved who were not directly invited. And they, they, their rights don't rely on that. It's not about the fact that we've contributed or that we've we were invited, it's we are here because you were there. So it's important to still say that. But it's important also to say we are here because you are there. So for non-citizens from other places, I'm thinking of obvious examples like people coming from Iraq and Afghanistan, but also people coming from Caribbean, Africa and other parts of Asia. We need to say we keep coming because you keep dispossessing, bombing and exploiting. And that is again about connecting the local struggles of people against immigration control in detention in Yarlswood, for example, to the global anti-imperialist politics, which says that immigration controls are the problem, not migration. So, it's important to remember Britain's colonial history. It's important to remember that the question of citizenship is not natural but political and changes over time. And it's important to remember that borders do not only respond to racist concerns, they actually feed them and produce them and produce new articulations of racism. We saw that with Brexit and targeting of Eastern Europeans. We see it in attacks on people who are hailed as asylum seekers before being violently attacked. Immigration controls feed and produce new kinds of racism. They don't just simply respond. So these should be our discontents when we hear debates about immigration and multiculturalism. We should talk about racism rather than diversity, about borders rather than migration, and about colonial history rather than cultural difference. <coughs> And there's no, way, there's no way that aggressive controls on immigration are going to make the lives of people here any better, particularly black and brown British citizens. We saw this with Brexit and the surge, a vote that's apparently on our membership in the EU, a surge in hate crime against black and brown people in Britain. And we know this from the Windrush scandal. But more importantly, there's no progressive politics which can be comfortable with a world of borders like we have today. I'll show you this, these images. 
and this is a, a, a vast underestimation of the number of people dying at the borders of imperial nations. So it could not be more urgent that our anti-racism is connected to resistance to bordering and that we refuse the logic of the border. This is a hard struggle in a racist country and a struggle, the struggle to make people, the case for people's right to move and to stay put is a hard one to make, but we have to try. That means solidarity with migrants at the hard end of immigration control, like the women's hunger striking in Yarlswood not long ago, for example. It also means fighting against cruel inhuman laws and making the radical arguments which emerge from a reckoning with colonial history. And it means trying to understand the global context for migration, to think back to those maps I showed you, and to understand ongoing forms of imperialism, displacement and dispossession which structure our world and the differential unequal mobilities of people in it. It should lead us to refuse the claim that immigrants or their cultural difference are the problem here. They're not the problem. The problem is racism, global disparity, nationalism, borders, not migration or multiculturalism. So that's my discontent. <coughs> and I hope it's yours. And so I'm just going to end by saying if that is our discontent, then there are lots of ways in which we can channel it and do something about it. And, oh no. Not as smooth as I intended. I just wanted to leave a list of some organisations that are channeling their discontent for the mainstream racist politics of this country and to encourage people to check them out, get involved. I know a bit about some of them if you want to talk to me after, but these people are some of the groups doing some work <coughs> around responding to the racist anti-migrant moment we're in. So that's it. I'll leave this up for it. Thanks.